long week, but, uh, you know, it's looking all right now. Enjoying the weekend. Very good. Very good. Yeah, let's uh, jump right in with um, the Axe Handle Saturday thing. Um, first question I'd like to ask is, with with all, everything going on this year with the um, the protest actions that are happening all over the country, uh, including Jacksonville, how does it feel to you having been involved in that, watching what uh, this new generation of activists is doing now? Well, it's always a wait and see, um, fighting racism and being involved in protest demonstrations does not always immediately return rewards, rewards in terms of whatever you are see seeking to accomplish. Um, there's nothing happening today, even with the death of George Floyd and with uh, the death of, of Omar Arbery and Breonna Taylor and just the, the litany of black folk who have been killed by whites or murdered by police. Um, that's nothing different than what is happening today. Social media has escalated these murders and these instances of white American racism up to a national level. So many white folk and black folk got a chance for the first time to see the police murder someone in living black and white. So obviously the, the response to what they saw initially is always an emotional response, but it's no different than the murders that we have experienced over the years. The fact now that there are those determined to do something about it even the Black Lives Matter movement is just an extension of the civil rights movement and other movements, which was an extension of other movements prior to that. So fighting racism is what I call the struggle and it, it continues every day and on and on and on. So what I'm seeing today is a, an increase in the number of whites who are much more visible in their opposition and obviously uh, those blacks, including uh, young blacks, although they have been on the periphery all along, but still they're willing to change the discourse in the public conversation about racism. Now, what happens as a result with a racist president and with racist elected officials, both in state houses and in the uh, United States, United States State, uh, United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. It remains to be seen how far along we, we go in this process. And those who are involved now who will seek to continue to fight. Um, it's not progress. It's just an evolution of times that we're seeing today. True. Um, I know from uh, my standpoint, working in the media and all that, um, the internet and social media has made it easier for people like me to assess what's going on around the country and like get a hold of the issues, get a hold of the people involved. And I know that people who are activists in different cities, like nowadays, they can be doing these um, these protests and be networked with each other in real time. You'll have people doing Zoom chats in the field in one city and in another city kind of connecting uh, the different groups. How do you think having something like having social media, having Facebook, Twitter, whatnot, from an organizational and logistical standpoint, how do you think the events of August 1960 would have been different in any way had you guys had access to that kind of technology back then? And, and, and I guess I, I always like to stay in the moment. Um, back in 1960, there was no networking other than the fact that we were all fighting the same enemy, the same villain. We knew who the enemy was, and it was white American racism and the racists that implemented white American racism. Um, but we did not check in with Atlanta and Nashville and Birmingham and Greensboro to see what they were doing. It was 
from those first sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina in February of 1960. Mm -hmm. And as the sit-ins spread throughout the country, uh, we all decided that we would do something in our respective communities. All civil rights demonstrations are local. And sometimes they are catapulted up by the white media who has never really understood black protests. You still have a, a white media that has a, has a dearth of black reporters. Um, it has taken them a heck of a long time to admit Donald Trump was a liar, even though he lied every day and that he was a racist. Yeah even though they saw instances of his racism well before he became president. So it has taken the, the white corporate media sometimes and the white local media sometimes to internalize what is right before their eyes. Uh, social media today in many instances has put the onus on the media to call it what it is, because if the media says fabrication, Twitter and social and 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 um, uh, Instagram and Facebook and others will say it's not a fabrication; it's a lie. Yeah, uh, it, it appears as if he uh, talks about blacks and browns differently than anyone else. No, it's not that. What he talks about, he's showing his racist stripes. Mm -hmm. So allowed that. He, and back in the day, in the 50s and the 60s, the, the Bull Connors and the Jim Clarks and the George Wallaces, they were all saying the same things, except the press would never call them racist. So yeah. social media has um, embarrassed the white media to the extent that they are beginning to tell the truth when they report on the news. Mm -hmm. If we had social media back during that time, I don't think it would have changed anything. We might have had numbers, um, uh, the way things played out, given what was apparent during that time when segregation and uh, there were laws on the books that allowed segregation, there were laws on the books that allowed white law enforcement officials to enforce segregation. There were laws on the books that would not allow black policemen to uh, arrest white folk. Um, so social media could have highlighted uh, back during that time what was happening, which, was, which is always a positive, but I'm not so sure it would have changed anything. Now, the other way of looking at it, had we had social media earlier, the evolution of things might have come that much earlier. We will see how social media today and how it has impacted the public discourse, what that means in terms of November and what that means in terms of issues to come as black millionaires and professional sports and, and others now have the legs up under them to talk about equality and to talk about racism. So we'll see how far that goes. True. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, all protests are, are local in nature. And with, um, to take for, for example, situation like this year in 2020 and some of the things in the past, you know, we're out there marching and protesting because of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Elijah McClain, uh, Ahmaud Arbery and whatnot. And I know there are some geographic variances in how those particular those police situations happen but how how do differences but among local communities influence the way protest movements come off like say what in terms of strategy organizational tactics what would be the difference between organizing a black lives matter protest in downtown jacksonville versus say downtown atlanta or downtown new york Back in the day or today? Uh, both. Well, with segregation back in the day, the largest venues, and in fact, primarily the only venues that we were able to use to get the word out, if you will, were black churches. Civil rights movement really was born in the black church. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so when, whenever we would have mass meetings, the uh, NAACP Youth Council, Jacksonville Youth Council, NAACP, when we would call mass meetings in black churches and we would go to churches on Sunday morning so that pastors would announce where the NAACP mass meeting would be later that Sunday, huh. That was the only way they got the word out, that we got the word out. Uh, the, Saturday, the Sunday after Axe Handle Saturday, we had a huge mass meeting at St. Paul AME Church, which was on the corner of um, 13th and Myrtle. There's still a church, the building is still there, but St. Paul obviously is out in Northwest Jacksonville on New Kings Road, but, but uh, the media that meeting to find out what was going on. No one could look at Twitter or Instagram or anything else to find out. It was an in-person type dispersal of information, getting the word as to what we were doing. And that day we announced the boycott of downtown and the boycott of the local newspaper, which did not cover any of the sit-ins uh, in on the pages of their paper or the two television stations that also did not uh, talk about the sit-ins for the two weeks prior to Axe Handle Saturday and then afterwards. And then after Jacksonville exploded in the kind of race riot that the mayor of Jacksonville at that time denied was actually happening or happened, mm -hmm. Uh, then they began to understand, and they understand it again today, how they did not serve this community by blacking out all the news on X Handle Saturday. Um, today, people know when there is going to be a demonstration in Atlanta, in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C. So that connection is there naturally because you share as black folks should and as protests should do. Um, our communication was snail paced. Mm -hmm. It was, we had to depend upon word of mouth. Uh, we did not have any media at our disposal. We had the black press, but they were mostly weekly papers and many of them still got out the good, the, the good word the Florida Star did as opposed to Jet and Ebony, which still covered a lot of what was going on as did a, 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 a national black weekly called the Pittsburgh Courier. Mm -hmm. But there was only so much they could do without that, that daily exposure. Uh, that is a lot different today. What it also highlights today is that many young people know that there is something that is not right, that does not pass the smell test, and the optics are not there. Uh, the problem with a lot of young Blacks in America today, because of racism both in education and racism that is veiled so the signs are no longer overt, but the signs are still there nonetheless. So mm -hmm. they are beginning to understand sometimes when they're well into their teenage years or young adult years, they know that they have been hit with something, but they don't know how to deal with it. Well, today gives them a different perspective on white American racism and what it is. And the response that has happened over the last four weeks, two months, I think has been indicative of an awakening um, as to what racism is to the extent, uh, again, in the media, they're beginning to use the term racism, which they have not ever used before. They always try to dress up yeah. uh, your financial, political, social control over a race of people who do not look like you. So now they're beginning to, to say it and people are beginning to talk about it. So many black young people are beginning to internalize it and understand that 
from the sit-in demonstrations and the demonstrations and the protest movement and the civil rights movement from the 50s and 60s, you had an emerging uh, black youth leadership that came out of the movement, just like you have now. Yeah. I met John Lewis and Marion Barry, who was the first chairman of the Student Nonviolent, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He was first, Chuck McDoo was second, John Lewis was third chairman. And I met them and Diane Nash and James Bevel and a lot of civil rights persons in a place called uh, the St. Helena Islands out from Beaufort, North Carolina and a, a center called the Penn Center, which was one of the very few, maybe one or two, three at the most, um, uh, areas, buildings, centers where blacks and whites could get together and talk about civil rights with some degree a modicum of protection because these were on islands and you had to cross a bridge to get to the Penn Center, which is still there. So those conversations were, were held at that time. You can have conversations like we're having now through Zoom or like others are having through Skype or whatever the medium is they can have those conversations now. The only difference is the convenience. The issues are, are all the same. The political issues are the same. The police issues are the same. The media issues are the same. Uh, educational racism is the same. Medical racism, environmental racism, none of that has changed. Uh, but now there's a medium to highlight it and talk about it and make people focus in on what has happened to a race of people in this country based on their hue of skin. In 1960, um, how many members were in the, um, the local NAACP Youth Council and how many people were involved in the actual sit-ins um, at Grants and Woolworths? Um, Saturday. We had between 400 and 500 members of the Youth Council. We might have gotten to 600, uh, but, but actively between 400 and 500 who had actual memberships. Our membership meetings every week, every Wednesday night would probably total between 50, 60 members, uh, maybe 70. I think one time we did get to 100. Um, when we set in the first day on August 13 at Woolworths, we had more than 100 youth council members. There were 84 lunch counter seats in the white, at that white lunch counter in Woolworths, which took up a whole side of the store on Monroe Street, the Monroe Street side of what was the J.C. Penney's building, Woolworths and J.C. Penney's were the only two occupants of the J.C. Penney's building and there was a common door where you could literally walk from Woolworths into J.C. Penney's. They had that kind of sharing. Mm -hmm. um, the only other building in that block was the Robert Meyer Hotel, which was at the back. Uh, J.C. Penney's building, Woolworth and J.C. Penney's fronted um, Hogan Street, Duval Street and Monroe Street were the sides of the building and at the rear fronting Julia Street was the Robert Meyer Hotel. But um, there was uh, Grants and Walgreens and McCrory's and Crest and a lunch counter in um, Coin Brothers, which was a part of the St. James Building, which is where City Hall is now, mm -hmm. uh, and Woolworth. So at all of those buildings, uh, all of those lunch counters, we always had enough students to cover every lunch counter. We never had to cover all of them. Even when we sat in at Woolworths, I think initially we had between 60 to 65 students that sat in in empty seats of the 84. We sat in around 11, 15 on that first Saturday. Um, but we had uh, youth council members who were prepared to sit in the seats as white customers would leave. Mm. But of course, after the first uh, minutes of, of um, our sitting in and a white waitress telling us we can't sit here that the colored lunch counter was at the back of the store, 
which you literally could not see from the time you walked into Woolworths. And, and one of the things that people today, uh, looking back 60 years with 2020 eyes, a sit-in demonstration at a lunch counter does not appear to be that kind of conflict, that kind of yeah. contradiction. Uh, but that white lunch counter was part of the comfort system of white folk in the South. Mm -hmm. No matter where they had to walk on the streets or even in a store, because the stores open up and wanted you to spend your money there. But that white lunch counter, those white restaurants were refugees for them so they didn't have to deal with black folk. Mm -hmm. When whites would shop, they know they could go and sit down at their white lunch counter there, this place of privilege, and they're sitting and eating with, with other whites. That was their status. That reinforced who they were. Yet a Woolworth, a Grants, a Coin Brothers said to black shoppers, we want you to spend your money in our store but we want to tell you where to spend your money. Mm -hmm. So before each sit-in, we would buy something from another counter, yeah. pencil, candy bar, whatever, mm -hmm. to show that these stores would accept our money at one counter and would not accept it at another counter. And, and the interpretation of that for me was that that was insulting. For us, that was insulting. Yeah. In fact, the title of my book, it was never about a hot dog and a Coke. My first book is to say we did not sit in just to drink a, a beverage and to eat a, a sandwich. Right. We sat in because those lunch counters were visible vestiges of segregation and racism. And we sat in to also dramatize our opposition to that segregation and racism. And when you sit in, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of demonstrations by Blacks in the South ended in violence, but you don't look at that. It's in your mind. Mm -hmm. The more important thing is you are fighting racism. And invariably, most people will tell you who have been in a sit-in demonstration, whatever they had to endure. Even John Lewis said that it was worth it uh, for the struggle, for the fight. So it was worth it to wake up Black folk and, and help them understand that as long as you looked in the mirror and you saw a Black face looking back at you, you've got to fight. The Constitution does not help you and your Black skin. Yes. You know, when you think about it, this country had to pass a civil rights law and two voting rights acts to give black folk the rights that should have been included and endowed to them from the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is ex absolutely alien to any logic. Uh, and as we see happening today, even with the Supreme Court, which used to be a, a bastion of, of, of equality after they made some of their ridiculous um, um, Plessy versus Ferguson and, and other separate but equals and, and other decisions that they made, they finally got it right with the Brown decision. And then we plotted along, and then they decided that corporations were in, could be treated as individuals yeah. with Citizens United. And obviously, that was an intent to not only circumvent civil rights for those persons who are marginalized in American society, but then they, they turned around and took the Voting Rights Act and just decimated uh, section five of that and what it meant to ensuring that black folk got a chance to, to fairly vote, which is a right, not a privilege. Yes. 
course, as we saw that same day, North Carolina and Texas changed their voting laws just to show that they can do some of the racist things that they had been doing all along. So it, it, it's, a, it, it's just an on, ongoing fight, an ongoing struggle, and the struggle continues. True. Uh, so philosophically and strategically, the, uh, the lunch counters of uh, the South, specifically the Woolworths lunch counter, was something that was spotlighted as the place to do um, the sit-ins. Um, by the time you guys got started in August, August 13th, 1960, how many other cities had done similar actions? We know about Greensboro, but had others been doing that? Yeah, um, about, uh, I was, uh, our youth council was an NAACP youth council, and there was a youth council division and a college chapter division. So we would get mail in every day at the NAACP office. Uh, mail both addressed to me as president of the youth council or to Mr. Pearson, uh, Rutledge Pearson, who was advisor to the youth council or the president of the Jacksonville branch. And it, they would give you, the NAACP would give you an overview since a lot of the sit-ins were conducted by NAACP college chapters. So we figured it was somewhere between 30 and 35 cities that had demonstrations after the Greensboro demonstration. The difference in the other demonstration, those students were college students. Yes. In Jacksonville, 95% of our sit inners were high school students. And we were still in school. Yeah. And obviously, we were still living with our parents. And even after graduating from high school, we were still living with our parents. So the only feasible time, even though we were chomping at the bit well before doing that, was during the summer. Uh, but we started making plans and we uh, teams went into different stores and we counted the number of chairs and we we walked around to see what was happening in those stores. Some stores like McCrory's did only had one lunch counter. So blacks would have to go down to the end of that counter, stand and place an order, even as a shopper, place an order if and when the white waitress came over to take your order. Then you had to wait until the order was brought back to you, coal or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, but when we sat in at, at McCrory's, we feel, at one time we sat in during the two weeks, there was basically no one at the lunch counter. So we filled up all of the lunch counter seats, about 18 in, uh, in Woolworths. Uh, but yeah, there were between 30, uh, around 35 plus cities uh, in the South. And of course, some of the sit-ins did not get the national publicity. Nashville did, obviously Greensboro did, uh, Washington DC did, although not in the South, but they had a sit-in there. Savannah did, Tampa did, Jacksonville did, but a lot of cities did not get the publicity. Uh, of the sit-ins, but many cities did conduct youth council and others did conduct sit-in demonstrations. Um, so uh, how many had you guys done prior to August 27th uh, here in Jacksonville? Well, every day from the 13th, with the exception of Sundays, every day we, from the 13th, we had a demo, we sat in at the lunch counters, all of them at the same time every day. Okay. From Thirteen to the twenty-seventh, hmm. and uh, you know, you guys were all teenagers. How did um, your parents? And well, question one: How did your parents and the older generation in general uh, respond to hearing your plans to do this? And two: What role did that the adult generation play um, supporting um, what you guys were doing at the time? Well, being young people, we did not share a lot of our plans with adults. Yeah. Obviously, we told our parents, um, but we didn't share a lot with, at the direction of Mr. Pearson, we kept, as our advisor, we kept a lot of what we were going to do and when we were going to do it pretty close to the vest. Mm -hmm. um, after we set in, then you had a, 
a number of blacks because, and I tell black folk and white folk that the black community was not monolithic during that time. Right. Everyone did not support the civil rights movement. Everyone did not support our sit-in demonstrations. Uh, we had some uh, black preachers the following Sunday, the 14th or the 21st, who um, from their pulpit had some negative things to say about our sitting in and, and our agitating and our doing some things that we should not be doing and how we were uh, upsetting the good race relations in, in Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. After, after Alexandra Saturday, uh, at, at my church at that time, which was an Episcopal church, Black Episcopal church, uh, and I write about it in my second book, a Black attorney said to my mother, Janelle, you need to do something about that boy. He's upsetting uh, circumstances for all of us. Uh, so this black attorney had crafted his nice little apple cart. Yeah. Doing what he was doing to benefit him. And of course, sit-in demonstrations and the resulting uh, riot, we did not attack ourselves. Yes. Uh, we did not start violence in downtown Jacksonville. We did not have bag sandals in the baseball bat. Uh, so white folk and black folk are quick to say, if you did not do that, then yeah. such and such would not have happened. Blaming the victim. So we are the victims and you blame us as the victims for causing our injuries, how we were brutalized and how we were killed. Mm -hmm. And that's been an age old pushback when you deal with white American racism. But uh, my, my mother was, um, after the sit in started, she was apprehensive as a mother would be. But at no time did my mother tell me no. Uh, and as I have talked over the years with members of the Youth Council, and even during the time, those of us who participated in the demonstrations, our parents did not tell us no. Now, I had classmates who graduated with me uh, two months earlier from high school, and I had other friends at other black high schools here in Jacksonville uh, who were told by their parents, no, you will not be involved in any of that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there were, there were those Blacks uh, whose parents saw sit-in demonstrations as somehow impacting where they worked and what they did. And they certainly did not want their children to be a part of that. But my mother did not have problems. Even after Axe Handle Saturday, yeah. she did say, okay, that's it for you. Mm -hmm. um, she obviously got much more involved in what the youth council would be doing. And as we would have weekly mass meetings every Sunday in different churches throughout Jacksonville, um, she was, she would come to some of those mass meetings just to hear what was going on. But at no time did she say to me, no, that's something that I don't want you to be involved with. Now uh, you were 16. Uh, you're 16 at the time. Uh, what high school were you going to? Uh, Northwestern Junior Senior High School. There were four black high schools in Jacksonville. That was Matthew Gilbert, Reverend Matthew Gilbert Junior Senior High School on the east side. There was Douglas Anderson Junior Senior High School mm -hmm. on the south side. There was Northwestern Junior Senior High School on the north side. And then there was Stanton uh, New Stanton High School uh, at the same location where it is now on 13th Street. And there were two black junior high schools, Isaiah Blocker and James Weldon Johnson. And they fed into New Stanton High School as a junior high school feeder school. So the school board had set up to make sure that there were uh, black there was a black junior high school and a black senior high school 
in each geographic location of the city mm -hmm. uh, to preclude school integration. Yeah. And uh, so August 1960, you were about to be a junior or a senior? No, August 1960, I had graduated. Oh, all right. I started school when I was five and I got skipped. So I always tell folk, my pastor said, fave ain't fair. Yeah. And, and I told those black folk, uh, black folk and white folk, if you don't know what that means, just ask somebody. But I graduated in June of 1906. And of course, two months later into our sit-ins. Um, but um, the, it, you know, Jacksonville was very typical of Southern white communities. Uh, yeah. The mayor of Jacksonville, Hayden Burns, who later became governor of Florida, yeah. was an avowed segregationist. We asked him well before the sit-ins to appoint a biracial committee, the NAACP uh, uh, adult chap, our branch, and the youth council jointly asked uh, Mayor Burns to appoint a biracial committee so that we could look at some of the issues and some of the problems in the community, especially how they impacted the black community. And his response was very publicly that he will not appoint a biracial committee, that biracial meant integration. And he was a segregationist. And if he appointed a biracial committee, his friends who knew he was a segregationist could think that all of a sudden now he was an integrationist, so he wouldn't appoint a biracial yeah. And that could be potentially dangerous even for somebody like that, you know, because oh, but, it, not that yeah. that's a concern, but the way they, you know, those people back then, they would often retaliate against white people who were seen as collaborating with the civil rights movement. Oh yeah, well it, it was, it was um, politically e efficient. Mm -hmm. Uh, for you to be uh, a segregationist then, just like it is politically efficient for whites running for elective office to be Republicans today and not say anything to contradict or appear to be in opposition to a racist president in the White House. Uh, but the concept of not wanting to talk about problems. Now, Jacksonville, Fort Lauderdale, Atlanta, St. Petersburg, Miami, Tampa. Mm -hmm. All of them were about the same place, late 50s, early 60s, in dealing with race relations. Um, a lot of them had the kinds of racism and segregation in their communities that had built up over a period of time. But those other communities at least confronted and dealt with some of the problems. Um, Jacksonville of those communities that I, that I listed was the only community, certainly one of, the, of a very few communities in the South that literally stuck its head into the sand. Yeah. Hoping that uh, these situations would go away or purposely ignored these situations, not giving a damn whether they went away or not. So what Jacksonville uh, did was become the beneficiary of ongoing neglect and an inability to talk about all things racist yeah. and all yeah. things about racism in the community and that continues to this day. Uh, Jacksonville supposedly is one of the 32 upper tier cities with an NFL team, still has not gotten beyond its small town, uh, town mentality. And, and I say, I mean, every time I say this, the, uh, those who are in the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce types, they just cringe and I say that I never use the word progressive and Jacksonville in the same sentence mm. because Jacksonville has not gotten to the point of being even remotely thought of as a progressive city. Yeah, so you, you're pretty sharp graduating at 16. Um, had you, at the time, August 1960, had you begun the, the college application process? And if so, moving forward, like, 
your involvement with the youth council and with the sit-ins, did that come up during the application process? And was that kind of like, like an extracurricular activity sort of thing? Is that, is that something that would go, you would put on a college application back then? Back during that time, you had what was called the United Negro College Fund exam. Okay. You would take that exam and based on your test scores from that exam, you were offered scholarships. I took the exam in, Febu in either January or February of 1960. And based on that, I was offered six scholarships. And I really wanted to go to Hampton Institute at that time. Virginia. Yeah, fell in love with the campus. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they offered me, I, I got scholarship letters, but none of the scholarships were free rides as we understand it. They were substantial, but you still had to buy your books mm -hmm. and there were incidentals that my mother and my stepfather could not afford. Uh, so I, uh, Marjorie Meeks and I both, Marjorie was the salutatory, Marjorie was the secretary to the youth council and one of the sit-in captains. And in fact, when Marjorie retired from the United States Postal Service, she was only one of two females in the country that was the postmaster of a city as large as Atlanta. Mm budget of over $700 million and two, 3,000 employees. Uh, but when I applied, um, when I got the scholarships, I, I had to turn them down because I didn't have enough money to accept them uh, based on the incidental expenses and based on the fact that Hampton was a good little way, ways away, but still, notwithstanding that, I did, my family did not have the money, uh, the, the extracurricular money. But I did apply, uh, Marjorie and I, I both applied to Edward Waters College, which is a local HBCU. Mm -hmm. And when the word got out that we were going, we were going to attend Edward Waters College, the mayor of Jacksonville called the president of Edward Waters College. And uh, this, uh, my mother and I were told both by Rutledge Pearson and Earl Johnson, who was the attorney. And at the time, the city was giving Edward Waters 25,000, giving JU 50,000. The county was giving Edward Waters College 50,000 and the county was giving JU 100,000. And the mayor called the president President Stewart of Edward Waters and said that if I went there, if I attended the school, he didn't know that Marjorie was, had also applied, but if I went there, that he would see to it that the money to the college from both the city and the county would be cut off. Oh. That never happened, uh, but the president in having a meeting with the faculty at the school explained to them, he had already approved my application I think that was one of the first times in the history of Edward Waters College where the president ended up approving a, a regular student's application to go to school. Yeah. Um, but again, that was just the nature of the beast. And that was not unique in, in other communities in Tallahassee, in Atlanta, in Nashville, at HBCUs. Um, pressure was being put on the president's of HBCUs to expel and suspend students from those HBCUs who were involved in sit-in demonstrations, and they did. Um, they also fired faculty members in the, after the summer of 1960, uh, three of my teachers, well, two of the teachers, three of the new faculty members at Edward Waters had come from other black colleges and they were fired because of their support of students who were involved in, in, in sit-in demonstrations. So it was, it was a time that, that, that were representative of your experiences in dealing with white American racism. Yeah. What year did you graduate from Edward Waters? I did not graduate. Uh, uh, in, after I, after I enrolled in Edward Waters, did quite well, made the dean's list the first semester. And then the word came down from the clerk of the draft board oh. that they were going to make sure that I was drafted. And this came by way of 
the NAACP attorney, Earl Johnson. So I joined the Air Force. Was that and drafting, the, was that a, was that politically motivated? Because you were sure. like barely, you were, were you even 18 at that point? Like maybe? I was, I had just turned 17 when I found out about it. And I enlisted in the Air Force one month after my 17th birthday in April of 1961. Hmm. Um, but if, if, you, if you went back and you studied draft records yes. in the early 60s and through the Vietnam War, you saw, and, and I had a deferment. I had a uh, 1S deferment for, for being a student. I was an active student in school. Yeah. Students in school were not subject to the draft, but they were going to make sure that I was drafted. Uh, and if you go back and check the statistics of, of black males drafted during the war from the early 60s to the end of the Vietnam War, you saw a disproportionate number of, of, of blacks. I, I met a gentleman after I got out of the Air Force who headed up a local group in town that helped young men, mostly white, go to Canada to get out of being drafted or even after they were drafted, mm -hmm. they ended up going, going up, help them get to Canada. But that was, again, that was part of what you dealt with during that point in time in these as yet United States of America. True. Um, what, what were the other uh, colleges that offered you scholarships? Uh, both of the Lincoln Universities, uh, one in, in uh, Pennsylvania and one in Oklahoma, uh, Missouri, rather. Um, Dillard, Morehouse, Hampton, um, Dillard, Morehouse, Hampton, both of the Lincoln Universities, and there was a, there was a sixth one, but I, 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 I want to say Howard, but I, I don't remember, but... Um, those five plus one more that I don't remember. Uh, we'll take a quick diversion here because I've actually, I'm writing a little something about Edward Waters College. You know, they got, um, I believe they got a grant recently that's going to allow them to sort of step up their accreditation and whatnot. And as someone who went there and, you know, you know the history of that place so well, I'd like to hear your thoughts on just the evolution of Edward Waters College over uh, the years and particularly how they've bounced because they they weren't in the best place a few years ago and it seems like they've they've bounced back kind of nicely over the last few years so i was wondering if you had any thoughts on that yeah and, and i worked at edward waters from 03 to 08 um edward waters was again one of those hbcu's oldest a uh, private college in the state, founded in 1868 by the AME Church, um, but one of those HBCUs necessary based on <clears throat> the lack of educational opportunities by um, traditional white, predominantly white institutions. Um, and it, it, it has been necessary in Jacksonville and has allowed a number of black folk to get their formative education in their <clears throat> undergraduate years. Um, and, 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 and quite a bit of history um, there was a very famous black coach, a guy named Buck O'Neill. The baseball the, player? Yeah, yeah. The, the very first black coach in, the, in Major League Baseball, he was, uh, he graduated from junior high school mm -hmm. in Sarasota. And Sarasota, Florida did not have a high school for blacks to attend. So Buck O'Neill came to Jacksonville to and enrolled in the high school division here at Edward Waters College, which is where he graduated. 
in the early 1920s, Edward Waters had a publishing company. It was called the Edward Waters College Press. And they were the only institution on the East Coast that published writings by Black females. Uh, and there was the first book they published was a book called Poetic Pearls uh, by a lady, I think her name was Mary Figg, F-I-G-G. Um, one of the founders of Phi Beta Sigma was Dr. Leonard Morse, M-O-R-S-E. And in 1930 to 1932, Dr. Morse was the president of Edward Waters College. And when I attended Edward Waters College in 1960, he was the head of the Department of Religious Education. So Edward Waters is steeped in a lot of tradition and history uh, to the extent where it should, it should be recognized and beloved much more than it is. But as we do with local institutions and local personalities, we kind of take them for granted. Yes. Uh, but um, I, I know Dr. Faison, Zachary Faison, uh, I knew Nat Glover, I knew uh, Claudette Williams, I knew Dr. Brunson, who had, been, who had retired from Bethune-Cookman, who was like an interim president to help Edward Waters wade part of the, the waters that they had when, the, when SAC Commission on Colleges tried to take their accreditation. And I knew uh, Dr. Jimmy Jenkins, who was very instrumental in a lot of things that allowed Edward, Edward Waters College to, to leap forward. Uh, but Faison is doing a good job in working on Edward Waters College becoming Edward Waters University. Yeah. Uh, and of course the name Edward Waters was the third bishop in the AME church. So wow. even the name of the college is uh, behind Richard Allen and Morris Brown. Uh, Edward Waters was the number three bishop. So it, it, it's a lot of history. It's a, what has happened to Edward Waters is what has happened to a lot of HBCUs throughout the country. When these HBCUs were in their prime, their glory, if you will, they were in neighbor, black neighborhoods that were considered very pristine, low income, I mean, middle income blacks as we interpreted at that time. But with the upward mobility of a lot of Blacks and with the advent of integration and with the change, yeah. as this we saw it with the Civil Rights Bill, a lot of Blacks moved out of some of these communities and many of these neighborhoods deteriorated and Edward Waters College was left in one of those deteriorating communities. Yeah. There have been and there is still an ongoing attempt to help yeah. revitalize some of the communities they're in, but uh, from Howard down through Edward Waters College, that has been a problem for many of the HBCUs, but many of them are, are beginning to, to deal with it and grow uh, even in spite of those neighborhoods. And many of them have helped the neighborhoods where they are. And some of them, you know, some of the more... Uh maybe more nationally famous ones, I think might, you know, they've got a little bit stronger endowment. They may have uh, some really high ranking, um, high ranking alumni of the, of that yeah. place. I know um, just the other day, Jeff Bezos, uh, the guy from Amazon, he got a divorce and his wife got like a couple billion dollars in the settlement. Yeah. He gave, was it like, was it Howard that she gave 20 million to? Well, she, she, gave a, she, gave, she gave money to five black HBCUs. Yeah, that's And I, that's think, I think Howard and Hampton and Dillard were at the top of the list, but there were five HBCUs that got uh, eight digit um, donations. Yeah, that's a uh, great thing. That's, that's, that's great. Prior to that time, uh, the heftiest uh, donation to a black school was when Bill Cosby gave 
twenty million dollars he and Camille to Spelman College in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, I was yeah, you know, I was born in seventy eight. So my first ex well, my uncle went to FAMU and you know, I knew people that went to EWC, but a lot of my first experiences as far as recognizing the, the legacy of HBCUs was because of Bill Cosby. He was always wearing the, uh, the yeah. sweatshirts on the show and, you know, yeah. different world was sort of set there, you know. Um, and like we were saying the other day, since the uh, Confederate statue came down in Hemming Park and with the whole protest thing that's going on, local people here in Jacksonville, especially younger people, people in their 20s and 30s, are really focusing and fixating on the African-American history in this community in a way that they never had before. And hopefully EWC can be a beneficiary of that kind of renewed knowledge that's going on. Now, There's a great legacy of, in fact, my, my second book <clears throat> is entitled, Unless We Tell It, It Never Gets Told Where There. Yeah. This is my first one. Um, uh, it was never about a hot dog or coke, and this is my third one, which just came out last week. Oh, I'll never forget who you are. Um, but when you when you deal with the legacy of of, of some of these schools, and when you understand. Uh, what some of these schools have done. And, and now as some people are beginning to recognize this history, <clears throat> in 1959, the Duval County School Board named a new white high school, Nathan Bedford Forest. Mm -hmm. And named Nathan Bedford Forest uh, based on a recommendation from the Daughters of the Confederacy. So here was a man who was a slave trader, who was a Confederacy general, yeah. who was a Fort Pillow butcher, who was the first Imperial Wizard of the Klan, right. and one of the founders of the Ku Klux Klan. No redeeming value whatsoever. That was a provocative gesture. That wasn't about, that wasn't, in some cases they could say, oh, he's just a famous Southerner, so we're naming it after him. That, they, they picked him because he was the founder of the Klan to name the school. And they picked him in the recommendation from the Daughters of the Confederacy as a response to the Brown decision. Mm -hmm. And they have admitted as much. I, I wrote a chapter about that uh, when Dr. Nikolai Vitti came to town he and in and, and my first conversation with him, and I took him a copy of my book, um, of my first book, and I said to him as we were talking, and I said, Are you familiar with Nathan Bedford Forrest? He said, No, explain that to him. I said, We've got a school here named for Nathan Bedford Forrest. So, anyway, we talked about that, talk about other things. So he called me back the following week and said, you've got some time to talk? I right. said, sure. so I went to talk to him again. And the whole conversation was basically about Nathan Bedford Forrest. He thought it was just so ridiculous, so crass, yeah. so insulting. And he's um, been down from Detroit, right? No, he um, uh, he's in Detroit now, he and his uh -huh. wife. Uh, I, I, I want to say he's from Miami. OK. Yeah. And um, so he eventually got a member, a black member of the school board to send a letter to him recommending that the school, that they change the name of the school. And this school was in her district. Uh, ho ho. Yeah, yeah. Give me about 10 minutes. All right. Um, I'm into my 3.30 Zoom meeting. Oh, OK. Um, Busy time right now? Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so black school board member sent a letter asking to read to change the name of the school. Uh -huh. And um, 
So they started the process and they put together a process where they had hearings and they had meetings. And the last part of the process was a panel discussion in the auditorium of the school, no press, no adults allowed other than the panel members. Uh -huh. And he asked me if I would serve on the panel to in support of changing the name. And in the auditorium, there were uh, the uh, two grades, 11th and 12th graders, and in the homeroom getting uh, closed circuit feed were the 10th, uh, 9th and 10th graders. Uh, so there were two whites uh, in support of keeping the name and two persons and another white guy uh, along with me in support of changing the names. And then they would vote afterwards. Um, and it was absolutely amazing. The, the white started off by saying, the, the male, male and the female, the male started off by saying, my opponents will tell you that Nathan Bedford Forrest was a slave trader. Well, yes, he was, but you have to understand that slavery was legal. My opponents will tell you that Nathan Bedford Forrest was referred to as the Fort Pillow Butcher when 300 Negro men, women, and children were killed during the Civil War under the flag of surrender. Well, yes, that happened, but, but he was in the back of his group, his squadron, and when he got up to the front and he found out what they had done, he told them to stop. He made them stop you know, after they had killed 300 people. Yeah. Same thing with the NACP and the, being the first imperial wizard. And, and I started off by apologizing to these four grades, 60% who were black, mm -hmm. uh, for what the school board did to them yeah. 54 years ago. This was 2013. And how they had such disregard for the students at that school. Uh -huh. that they would shackle them with graduating from a school yeah. named after the founder of the Klan. In, bottom line, the, the students vote, voted 67. It was their final decision. Uh -huh. It was a school board, but still the students made the final decision and a recommendation onto the school board. And these students voted 67% to change the name. Yeah. And then they picked the name West Side and the name the Wolverines. <clears throat> and uh, so when, uh, and then afterwards, we had convers I had conversations with teachers that students didn't vote until after they were voting, but you didn't know what the final vote was uh, until after the voting was completed. So Dr. Vitti called me to tell me that I would, to thank me and then to say that I would be pleased at how the voting was going. Uh -huh. And then he asked me if I would come to the school board meeting on that Monday. And then earlier that Monday, he told me that the students had voted 67 to 33% to change the name. And the school board, with the exception of the two black members, instead of them saying, notwithstanding what the students voted, I support them and I would have changed the name too. But the white school board members saw that as an opportunity to use the students as cover. You know, uh, it doesn't make any difference how I think about it. The fact that the students want to change the name, then I support the students, yes. Uh, yes. which was such a cowardly way of dealing with something that should be changed. The, moving, the, moving the statue to the Confederate soldier out of Hemming Park. Mm -hmm was done in the dead of night. Yeah, I was there. Four o'clock one morning, yeah. So, and there was no legal reason for that statue to be there in Hemming Park. No. It had been there for years. I've got a picture in my book of, of in my first book of, of Woolworth and Pennies looking west from Laurel Street looking, uh, looking west and there in the middle of the park is the statue to the Confederate soldier. So Jacksonville, in addition to uh, the number of uh, parks and schools named for, uh, and of course the city of Jacksonville named after 
Andrew Jackson, who was responsible for the killing of more indigenous American Indians than any other person yeah. in history. Uh -huh. uh, and that's who Jacksonville is named for uh -huh. with a statue that's still in close proximity to downtown. But that's where Jacksonville is. That's the kind of community it is. And I know that, but I, I chose to stay here in Jacksonville because no matter where you fight racism, you might as well fight it in your hometown. That's right. Um, I know you got to go in a little bit. I, if you don't mind, we'll knock out a couple real quick questions. We can always jump back in, follow up a bit later, but I was curious. So when you guys were outnumbered by the attackers on Axe Handle Saturday, uh, my understanding is that you guys were, you know, in terms of numbers, outnumbered maybe about three to one, something like that, like yeah. about three. Yeah, more than that. Um, 200 whites, it was 35 of us that Saturday. Okay, okay, yeah, so that's seven, that's seven to one. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was the weather like that day? Do you remember sunny. waking up like a nice sunny day? Yeah. August. Yeah. I mean, it, it was a typical uh, August day. There were no thunder boomers in the afternoon. Uh, maybe cli uh, climate change and, and global warming was not an issue in 1960. Uh, but it was a regular sunny summer day. Yeah. The Olympics were going on at the time. So that would have been on TV. Uh, I think the Olympics had already been held, I think had been already held uh, by the time we set in. I think, I'm not sure. I'm not yeah, they sure. did the uh, the swimming events that day. Like a oh, they did, okay. Of records okay. in swimming. You know, 1960 okay. was the year uh, Ali won the gold medal in boxing. Yeah, it was also the year that we lost both the 100 and the 400 meter relay. Really? with a guy named Ray Norton, who was supposed to be a track superstar. Yeah. And he lost 100, and then they passed out of the passing lane huh. in the meter relay and was disqualified. And then fast forward four years later. Bob Hayes. And, and hometown star Bob Hayes, including anchoring the 400 meter relay in next to last place and running the fastest time ever recorded for an anchor leg in the Summer Olympics. Now, you said there were 35, uh, 35 um, people at the sit-in on the 27th. That seems to be a little bit less than like in the previous we were, we were at Grants. Oh, at Grants, yes. We were at Grants, and Grants had a smaller mm -hmm. uh, lunch counter than Woolworths. We were not at Woolworths that day because of the whites in him and Park. Mm. Whites in Confederate uniforms passing out axe handles, so we decided we would go to. We decided we were not going to not demonstrate. Yeah, uh, but we sat in at another store. And no one sat at Woolworths. So I guess it started on the 13th. So by that point, the the process by which uh, the white people with the axe handles they knew well in advance that something was going on. So they had time to prepare to drive down there to bring their weapons. I'm, I met an FBI informant in 2000. His name was Clarence Sears, and I talk about that in, in my first book. Um, he was assigned to the Klan by the FBI, uh -huh. and he wrote up the Thursday before Axe Handle Saturday, the Klan had a meeting in downtown Jacksonville at one of the hotels, and they at that meeting made plans to start a race war hmm. using the sit-ins to do that. Um, the, he gave, he wrote up the report, gave it to his FBI handler who put it on the desk of the Duval County Sheriff who was Dale Carson, who was a former FBI person. Yes. And we found out later that that report was intercepted by a, by one of Dale Carson's lieutenants who was a member of the Klan. Yeah found out later that the the uh, National Guard was on standby both in St. Augustine and at Camp Blandy. Whoa. So they knew something was going to happen. Yeah. But downtown that day, there were no police. Huh. And, and I need to try to get on my... Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my oh, other Zoom call. 
Two more quick things. Number one, out of the 35 that were at Gramps that day, how many were women? 10 to 15. 10 to 15. And out of the 35 at Grants that day, how many, how many people there that day are still with us? I can only, including myself, say four. Wow. There might be more, but that's all that I know of. All right. Well, thank you very much. This is uh, plenty. Uh, let me know. Do your thing. Let me know uh, if uh, you have time to follow up. Uh, tomorrow or in a couple of days. Well, 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 well call me back if, if you need more. Will do. Thank you. All right. Good talking with you, Sheldon. You too. Have a good day. All right. You do the same. Mm -hmm.